It was more about having a sense of a connection between the earth and the sky and the opportunity to work within that space to allow people to blossom and thrive, really. Architecture is frozen music. It turns shelter into a joyful connection between whenua and whānau. He whakapū mau i te tū a te tangata i te Born in 1924 in the Hawke's Bay, John Scott was arguably the first Māori architect. He grew up in a time when tangata whenua had very little visual expression outside of the pa. He had this incredibly rich Māori background and understanding of space, yet he had this experience of an architect in Western ways of building. His kaupapa was to bring two worlds together. He's been able to create spaces that really connect with people, and people of all cultures. Ko ngā mahi hua hua Māori he auaha i te taiao kia tutuki ai ngā tikanga, me ngā mahi. Wider New Zealand had not embraced Māori use of design in space until John Scott put his pencil to paper. Scott was about looking for the wairua within a building, thinking about its relationship to whenua, how does that get represented, how do you imbue those spaces with those intangible qualities of life. Our father designed houses that considered the environment, the land, mountains, the weather, the sun. Shelter's the essence. If the view's there, you get it there, it doesn't matter what you do. But the big thing is to be able to undo your saddle with the fingers that will undo the buckles and not freeze on you or get cold, that sort of thing. John Scott was born into a post-war era when being Māori was not always celebrated. The 1960s saw a push for integration and one nation. Māori were generally labourers on building sites or carpenters, not necessarily project managers or architects. It was probably the force of John Scott's character that made him accepted within the architecture community and the wider building community. Somehow we had a rapport and just Peggy did all the noise. She yeah. made all the noise and she became the mouthpiece for all of us, you know what I mean? Nonsense. <laughs> he was offered jobs on uh, a lot of the major Pākehā owned farms all around this district, but uh, they gave him a pretty free hand. It was very prog progressive in that sense. Nā reira, ka tata Scott hora haere i āna tai ki ngā wahi mā ki ngā whare maha. For John, I think he understood what it was like to live in a rural location. Not just how Māori rural people live, but, you know, non-Māori as well. And for him, you know, if you look at the arrangement of spaces within the houses, unfolds in the way that a person would naturally move through that space in an environment that was already connected to the outdoors and had a really important relationship with the outdoors beyond. The unique design elements in Scott's work were inspired by both his rural upbringing and his heritage. A key inspiration, the whare nui. The Potoko Manawa is the central column within a whare nui or meeting house. That's where most of us would, would understand that column. And it's an anchoring column conceptually, spatially, culturally. Po helps to create space between the earth and the sky and um, we can live in that space and uh, play in that space. So around that po, things um, radiate and around, uh, around a person, things radiate. So I think a person can be a po and around a building, things radiate and a building can be a po. If we look at one of his most important buildings, such as Fortuna Chapel, 
you'll see the pōtoko manawa used in such a way that it is an anchoring element, and you do get that strong sense of it as being the heart of the building around which everything else unfolds. Built in 1961, the Fortuna Chapel would take Māori architecture out of the marae and embed it into the New Zealand vernacular. He thought it was important that the priests built it themselves. They weren't builders, so they put that together themselves. That's about people having a stake in their own place. This chapel would see John Scott's designs recognised across the world, and so affirming his place as an architect and poked it all for the next generation. I think being an architect myself, I can kind of see how much work he really put into all of his buildings, and everyone always moans about how long plans took him to, to do. But actually, he was drawing up the same amount of detail that we have to do now which was a lot of work to be doing by hand. Yeah, I don't know if many people appreciate every little corner that he really worked on quite hard, all in his mind. Like, it wasn't 3D modelled, it was all 2D, pencil and paper. If you make a mistake, you chuck out the whole sheet <laughs> and draw it again. The idea started to gel then, is to get this enclosure relevant to this courtyard that we're sitting at the moment by exploding the middle out like a, like a volcano, so the pieces that dribble on the fringes of this pyramid tend to represent partly, you know, you know depends on how you kid yourself in this respect. <laughs> I think it's a matter of kidding. It's the lava flows, you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. I would say that he broke barriers in terms of Māori architecture and Māori architects moving into the wider field of building in New Zealand at a time when Māori architecture had been suppressed. Te ao Māori, that worldview kind of brings in such a dynamic perspective that really adds so much richness and um, quality to design. Yeah, why wouldn't you? <laughs> When I think of John Scott's work, I think about his incredible contribution to the development of modernist architecture in New Zealand, taking it away from square boxy forms and actually imbuing it with the mana of the landscape. A reclamation of Aotearoa through design. I think he had a sense of um, how can you make spaces that connect with the whenua and how does that make you feel? He's laid down a, an amazing kaupapa and just kind of have to run with that foundation and build on it. And when I think of John Scott's work, I think of the legacy of a man who genuinely wanted to improve the way that we live today. <laughs>